interesting because having worked with you so long and seen all your movies, it's not that different in some ways than the other films you've done, even though the comedy part is a little more subdued. You know, the, the thing about you guys as, as filmmakers is that the, there's sort of this humanity that sort of pervades all of the stories, you know, whether it be Little Children or Little Miss Sunshine, you know, or Election. Uh, Nebraska, they all kind of thematically have this variety of characters who are very, very flawed to one extreme or another. Is that something you consciously do, or is it something that you think just gravitate towards? Well, flawed characters are much better in a dramatic sense, um, even for comedies. I don't think we ever thought consciously uh, we're going after flawed characters, but I think the things that make American culture interesting because there's so much, uh, in a way, cultural freedom to define yourself either in a delusional way or a constructive way or a, you know, a perhaps self-destructive or, or basically through some act of will or self-definition that you can overcome yourself. All those seem like good dramatic situations to us. Yeah, and I think people with obstacles to overcome, um, it, it, you know, it's the stuff of, of good drama or, um, you know, just uh, good character arcs. And, we, you know, we're attracted to that aspect of it, for sure. So I could probably say they don't make too many films like this anymore. And you guys often choose some of the more difficult things to get made. You mentioned, you know, the last two films took 10 years to make. And how do you manage to keep that tenacity and that ability to kind of believe in making films like this, which are fantastic, but very difficult in the system that we live in, and, and is that something you feel like, uh, you know, it, it, is it part of the game, or is it just really just you can't kind of help yourselves? <laughs> well, I, I think in this case, with Lowdown, uh, the memoir was, um, was so powerful, and uh, such a strong story about a girl overcoming, um, you know, a very difficult childhood, Combined with, um, it was set in a world of, uh, of jazz music in Los Angeles, and it's a whole uh, milieu and culture that has kind of died out. And so, um, he, you know, we hadn't really seen a story set in that world, and uh, Amy's memoir was so powerful that, um, you know, and, and also was very attractive to actors. So over the years, there were many, many great actors that wanted to play the parts, and that always was uh, reassuring to us that there was a, you know, something, something for them to sink their teeth into, and a story for us to tell. So that, that's what sort of kept us going on this one. Yeah, yeah well, in, independent films like this have gotten to be much, much harder to make, as you've probably heard. Um, and um, we probably should turn this into like a, a IFA, Independent Film Anonymous meeting. Because, um, <laughs> we've got to somehow keep ourselves from doing films that, you know, they're just very, very difficult to make and to market. Yeah, but thankfully you guys still do them because I think the people who do appreciate it really need it because, you know, it adds to sort of an American cinema that is being lost very quickly and so we appreciate it. And, uh, you know, there was something early on in this movie that I noticed and I don't know if it was intentional or just my imagination, but there was like these circus sort of references. And there was something about, you know, this sense of like a human circus around her. And that's just something that I, I was wondering if there was, when, when thinking about this film, what, what, what exactly do you guys interpret here besides sort of what you already said about the, the sort of the music and the things that sort of made this era interesting. Was there something uh, specific about the, the themes of the film that you were trying to get or the director was trying to get? I, I, I just was reading into it a little. It was like, it just seemed like this almost, at a moment it almost seemed like there was a, you know, a magical realism component to it, even though that was not clearly as far from that. Although I think in the scene with Peter Dinklage, when she goes into his little hole-in-the-wall apartment, there is a kind of, uh, almost like a a magical realism element to it. But, um, you know, for us, it, it's funny because um, often when reviewers have been writing about this movie, they compare it to King of the Hill, which of course was our first movie. And um, I don't think they're aware necessarily of the connection, but um, 
uh, you know, that was also about a child growing up in a transient hotel and a motel hotel in, in St. Louis during the Depression. And the whole uh, uh, people who lived in that hotel all had a kind of, um, uh, you know, unusual quality to it, so, uh, to them. And so, you know, I, I don't know, I think a child in this world with, um, you know, exotic people on all sides and uh, kind of an exuberant but also fraught with danger is something that, you know, that appeals to us. So, uh, so I just, the casting part, because of course everybody needs to know that amazing casting, and were these people who you went after, did they come to you? I mean, this, this is the kind of script that actors do approach your agents and say, I want to be in it. How hard was it to cast, and what, what was the process of getting these particular actors? Well, it wasn't particularly hard. I mean, um, John Hawks um, was a fantastic guy, and we met with him, you know, years ago, and just were always a fan and sent the script. And I think actors are really the things that save the possibility of making films like this. And same with Elle Fanning, uh, committed, you know, without a lot of, of hurdles to jump through. And, and really, it was kind of amazing how much um, uh, the actors uh, wanted to do it without, you know, they, they really made it possible. Although there was a long road on this. We um, initially, we had uh, approached uh, Dakota Fanning to play the lead. And Elle, at, at that point in time, the story was a seven-year-old girl and then a, a, a 13, 14-year-old girl. And so we wanted Elle to play the younger version of Amy. And then we ended up with another actress, Saoirse Ronan, who's a great Irish actress that attached to Amy, and she became too old. And then uh, Chloe Moritz, and then she became too old. Mark Ruffalo was going to play the part of John Hawks. Originally, we went to John Hawks to play the part that Flea ended up playing, of Lester Hobbs. And it's just, you know, we were at it so long that finally, when we were ready to make the film, Elle was old enough to play Amy, and Glenn Close fell into place, and, you know, Peter Dinklage we always had in mind. But there was, they, we were at it so long that people, actors came and went. Uh, yeah, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I don't want to, I want to let other people ask questions, because, uh, you know, it's an amazing, amazing film, and uh, I feel like there's so much to talk about. I'll talk to you much more about it later, but what about other people here? Uh, I saw some of this movie at Sundance earlier this year. Was there any editing done on it since then? Because it felt, to me, and it's already pretty pretty dark, but it felt even darker. This time? Did. Yeah. There was a lot of editing. Uh, I, I, I don't know that we... Uh, uh, we certainly didn't intentionally make it any darker. Um, I, it's shorter, it's about six minutes shorter than it was at Sundance. And the ending, well, the ending is darker, um, if maybe that's what you're, you know, the way it ended at Sundance, she's in front of the mirror and uh, uh, in the bathroom and um, she picks up the needle and then she puts it down and, you know, there's no voiceover and she clearly, or, the point was that she had made a decision not to fall into the same path as her parents. And then here, I, it ended up truer to the, the, the true story in the memoir, where for a period of time she did explore drugs, but then ultimately decided it wasn't worth, you know, what she had seen her parents go through. So, yeah. but, but that, yes, that, that was a difference. Yeah, people keep talking about the movie as dark, and it's definitely got a darkness to it, but there's this incredible love that pervades everything, which kind of gives you, there's a lot of movies that uh, maybe have, you know, more humor in them, but that sort of element of this movie kind of gave it a very uplifting quality, some, to some degree, I know it sounds weird, but did you feel that way about the movie, that there was somehow, like you said, transcendence, you know, in that? Yeah, that I think was a big part of the theme that was appealing, is that the culture can be sort of screwed up in transition, and the people around you can be, you know, very unstable or troubled. But in a way, if you have this combination of a parent who loves you or someone who cares about you and, and an idea of your own identity, that you can push through a lot of that and, and, and really become very, you know, happy in your own life, which is the case with Amy Albany. So the idea that when you think back to 1974, which is about the time I moved to Los Angeles. You know, the, the, 
the whole thing of having a network to save you or an internet or cell phones or therapists, you know, you're kind of left, particularly if you're in a certain class, on your own to, to struggle to survive and to find yourself. And ultimately, um, however it comes through to, to different people, it, it's really a story of not surrendering to the darkness that is easily available and, and finding another path out. Yeah, and in this case, the you know the characters were, although deeply flawed, although Joe Albany was deeply flawed, I, I mean, he still clearly loved his daughter, and she, as she says, loved him beyond all proportion. And same with Glenn Close. I mean, obviously, she was a, a character um, of complexity in her. I mean, you know, that scene where, uh, you know, don't you dare talk to your father that way. Um, you know, uh, how, how quickly she, you know, turned on Joe's behalf against Amy when Amy called him a monster. Um, I mean, these, these are complicated relationships, but there, were, there were clearly was love beyond everything. So he kept hoping to see it in her mother, you know, and somehow that never really seemed to materialize. Al although some people interpret that scene in the bar that the mother in some way is is trying to save her daughter by, by you're not going to get it from me and you're not going to get, you know, that in, a, in a way she's pushing her away. And that may be a generous interpretation. What did Amy say about that? Uh, Amy uh, wasn't very fond of her mother. <laughs> All right, anyway. and, uh, yeah. Well done, then. The very people who stayed for this Q and A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, th you know, uh, that's uh, that's tough. Uh, we're, we're not quite sure. I mean, you know, clearly it's very adult material. I mean, my 15 year old saw it and was blown away by it. And and I, you know, I think um, people people who understand, you know, or connect to transcending problems. And, uh, you know, it's a very adult story. People who are interested in jazz, I think, might connect to it. Uh, we're, we're not really sure, but often we don't think, maybe we don't think as much about an audience as we should when we go into these things. But uh, if, the, if it's a story that, that we're moved by and uh, we're compelled to tell, then often we dive in and, uh, you know, hope that, you know, who would have, Nebraska, um, I mean, there are things that are more accessible on the face of it, but it's a black and white film. It doesn't have any actors that are in demand at the moment, and it's, you know, it's, it's got a leisurely pace, and yet, you know, that found an audience. So hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll find something out there. I, I actually think one of the great things about movies like this in this day and age is that it doesn't have to find its audience in the first weekend or even two or three or four weekends. And, this movie feels very much like one of those movies that 10 and 20 years from now people will seek out and the right people will find it. And that's something that I think is important because you don't want to go into this movie unexpected. You know, you don't want to not know what you're getting into a little bit because we do have this concept that you have to just be quote unquote fully entertained and laugh and everything. And I think that's, you know, unfortunate because the movies are out of the theaters quicker than the people who need to see it need them to, to need to be, and so therefore I think this one is perfect for this generation. You know, people will find, young people will find, and I know you really like this in the uh, So, that's what I think. I don't care. <laughs> I'm really curious as to the range of emotions you must experience when uh, you're experiencing a 10 year gestation period for a film. Like, how do you, what are the range of emotions you feel during that process, and then at the conclusion when you're finally completed it, Well, um, you know, it depends on the movie, really. Um, I, you know, some movies arrive and are embraced and, you know, you, you feel tremendously satisfied. And then other times you're, you know, you're sort of haunted by different things that happen along the way and, you know, things in the script that maybe play out in the movie that, you know, you, you wish you had been able to fix. And it's a whole range of things. But, but um Basically, it's a, you know it, it, it's it's an achievement to get these done and have them uh, uh, close to your intention when you first read the material, and there's a great sense of satisfaction in that. So, uh, in, in this case, you know we were we were very moved by this story, and and we think that um, you know it's a uh, it's a very strong representation of 
of how we experienced it in reading the, the memoir. So, I, 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 one maybe one last question, or unless we are up. sure I understand the question. Oh, the, the oh, uh, of how the writing of the, the movie is made, um, particularly of how there, there are sometimes this executive too much of uh, creative power asking a writer to uh, make the script of the quality or to get a massive We on this one didn't have any executive saying anything. I mean, there was no executive. So it was really just uh, meeting with the, the writers and the trying to work out what would, you know, and with the director, of course, what would be the, the most realized version of, of this story. So, um, we, um, we really uh, wrestled a lot with it and met a lot and it went through many drafts, but if, if part of what you're asking is, was there an interference that somehow trivialized the story or and it was an attempt to make it uh, much broader appeal. Uh, those things weren't operative in this uh, in this process. We really only have each other to say, you know, that, that each person spoke up for what they thought would be the best version. Because it was based on a memoir, it, by its very nature, it was kind of episodic. This this adaptation and the screenplay was never the uh, the central thing about, about this movie. It was um, the director was much more interested in the characters and the milieu and the atmosphere. And, and in a way, um, that ran a little bit contrary to our orientation because I think we're in general a little more narrative driven. And so uh, there was a tension throughout this whole process of, um, you know, is this story building in a satisfying way, in an emotional way, or is the, um, the milieu going to carry you through, uh, and and that tension, you know, played out in the in the development of the screenplay and in the editing of the movie, and you know, I, I think it, um, it in a lot of ways it's what makes this particular movie very unique is that it uh, it, it doesn't follow uh, screenplay rules in in you know in the way that a lot of other movies do. Right. Yes, yes, yes. One, one, one last thing I want to say is that there's a performance tomorrow night. You should tell them about that, which, you know, and I also just want to ask in conjunction with that, last thing on the music, because it was such an important component of this. And was that music specifically, how did you choose that music? How did that come about? And, uh, and then talk about tomorrow's performance. Well, there, there are actually two performances tomorrow. One is with uh, Maureen, where we're going to be. Uh, uh, talking to her um, and uh, about uh, producing and all that. And then tomorrow night there's going to be a jazz cafe where Ohad Talmor, who's the composer for the film, will be performing music from the film with some of the musicians. And um, the music was a critical element in this movie. Uh, Jeff Price is a huge jazz fan. A lot of the music that you've heard is either Joe Albany's music uh, some of it reconstructed by Ohad, and then a lot of the source music, which was jazz from the time that influenced Joe and that he was listening to at the time. And uh, it was very careful. John Hawks doesn't play the piano. Ohad worked with him very carefully on uh, learning those solos so that it, it appeared convincing. Flea, on the other hand, started, he got a start as a jazz trumpet player when he was a young kid growing up in L.A., and so Flea is really playing the the trumpet uh, uh, in the movie, and um, this was a way of him honoring uh, any of the you know, people that he got his start with when he was a teenager, so. Well, 
So there is more tomorrow with you, Maureen, but unfortunately that's sold out. So the, the, oh, there's a wait list. So wait list. But these people are fortunate to have listened to uh, what you guys have to say, and thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.